two teams are locked in battle for one of the biggest prizes in Team Tempin. But it's a prize with a difference. No individual honours, no single champion. This contest is all about teamwork and national pride. The very best from the USA and Europe are competing over three days for the Weber Cup, Tempin's very own answer to the Ryder Cup. We've crossed the halfway mark and there's little to choose between the two teams. The pressure is building, the winning line is in sight. Who will rise to the challenge? For 17 years, the fate of the Weber Cup has been fought over. There's been no shortage of stories to tell, as some of the greatest names in the sport have battled it out, watched by an ever-growing audience. In the first three years, USA dominated. They looked unstoppable as they clocked up win after win. However, from 2003, Europe took control, winning their first title, and they went on to claim three Weber Cup victories. One of the closest tournaments was in 2006, when USA claimed back the title, winning 18-17. And the trend of three consecutive wins continued, as Team USA went on to win in 2007 and 2008. In 2009 saw the debut of Martin Larson to Team Europe. A new team player seemed to be the winning ingredient as they sealed their first victory for four years. And the Europeans celebrated success again in 2010 when they were captained by Oscar Palermo. 2011 saw a comeback for USA and in 2012 they also went on to smash Europe by an impressive 17-7 scoreline to defend their title. In 2013, Europe had a point to prove after their thrashing the previous year. And despite two perfect games from the Americans, Europe won back the trophy with a 17-14 victory. In the following year, the tournament went all the way. In a dramatic conclusion, Europe took the win 17-16, defending their title in front of a jubilant Barnsley crowd. The drama of 2014 was difficult to replicate 12 months later. Not that Europe cared, they made it three in a row, and a year later they added a fourth title. History really does beckon in the 18th edition of the Weber Cup. The pattern is clear for all to see. Periods of American domination followed by the Europeans. It's only stretched to three years at any one time. The Americans dominated the first three years. Europe came back in 2003. Team USA next. Things tightened up with Europe stringing together two wins, followed by a couple from the Americans. But for Team USA, the worrying trend started in 2013. Four years of European domination. The question is, can Europe make it five? The format is simple enough. The magic number here at the Weber Cup is 19. It's the first team to reach that target that claims the trophy. One point per match, with the matches consisting of singles, doubles and a baker. A team match involving all eight players. As for the scoring, it's been simplified. The matches are played over 10 frames, there's no extra shot in the 10th. The strike is worth 30, and of course the magical score still remains the 300 game. Europe have been chasing this tournament from day one. The Americans claimed the opening two matches and set the tone. It was left to Jesper Svensson to save the day. He responded with points that kept his team in touch, helped by Barrett winning in the final match of the session. Day two showed a closer fought contest as the Europeans edged their way back into contention. Barrett won the opener and despite the USA winning three games on the trot, Europe found a way back in via Stuart Williams and then through the partnership of Larson and Svensson. The USA finished with a win and finished two points clear of their rivals. The evening session and the 15th match of this tournament saw all eight players turn out for the Baker match. Europe, in a determined mood, recorded a 2.86 to win comfortably. Stuart Williams had momentum on his side and eased past Kyle Troop. Suddenly, Europe were posing a real threat. Match 17 gave a glimmer of hope to the Americans as EJ Tackett inflicted a rare defeat on Jesper Svensson.
That result for the Americans proved a temporary blip. Barrett was back and leading from the front with a big win over his fellow captain, Sean Rash. Martin Larson didn't have to rely on luck when he faced Marshall Kent. His score of 2.77, enough for a comfortable win. Jesper Svensson then gained revenge on EJ Tackett and increased his size advantage to two points. A rare moment for Team Europe in this year's competition. The real test will come in our next match. The captain's pick. Anna Wilkes is talking to both Dominic Barrett and Sean Rack. Okay, captain's pick time. Sean, I'm going to come to you first. Based on the fact that Europe have won seven out of the last nine matches, I'm guessing it's a pretty tricky decision for you. No, not at all. Uh, look, we've said it all along. It's going to be a fun weekend. It's going to go till the end. Uh, they've uh, they finally started clicking. They, we all know they weren't bowling up to their standards the first couple of rounds. And uh, we've decided to go with Martin. Um, great bowler, just came off a great match and a big win for his team a couple games ago. But that's who we're going with. He did say to me in his winner's interview a couple of games ago that he wasn't too worried if he was captain's pick playing on this on this lane as a second one out. I think all of us should always be worried uh, to be chosen to bowl. But like I said, we're all great bowlers. Uh, we're all going to figure it out. The last couple of rounds or matches so far really has come down to the ninth and tenth frame. There's been some up and down. Certain shots go one way and it all evens out, uh, as the great players always say. OK, so Martin will be going up for Team Europe, but Sean's already scooting off, which suggests he might have a sense about who you're about to pick. Dom, who is going to be your captain's pick? Yeah, it's going to be Sean. So I'm going to tell you why. So same as last night. It's, uh, EJ's just come off bowling, could have bowled better, but reigning player of the year, it's so hard to pick him, especially, and we know you don't really pick the person that just came off the lane. Kind of surprised us why to pick mine. He only just came off before. We kind of thought they were going to pick Stu or maybe I bowled pretty well, but you never know. And then uh, Marshall's having a really good tournament. And uh, who's that leave? Kyle. Kyle just loves this lane a little bit too much. So we wanted to make sure he didn't get too much uh, more game time. And Sean kind of said something about his back earlier too, and he's been sitting out a while. So yeah, we put Sean back in. It will be a very interesting matchup. Thank you very much, Tom. Confirmation of the leaderboard and the captain's pick, Rash versus Larson. The Americans faced with a winning European team struggled to find a choice. Sean Rash, the obvious one for Europe, as he clearly struggled against Barrett, both his form and back injury about to be put to the test. Time then to join our commentary team of Cass Edwards and Nick Hawley. Europe very much in the ascendancy. They've dominated Saturday night. It's been all right for Team Europe, that's for sure. It's been all wrong for the Americans. Well, they do say Saturday night's all right for a fight, but it's not really been a fight, has it? It's been very much a one-sided uh, boxing match, if that's what you want to call it. If this was boxing, a referee would have stepped in by now. But it's not, it is bowling, and it's Martin Larson. Straight in the pocket and out of the blocks fast. No corner pins, how about that? That's the other Swedish guy. <laughs> yeah. Straight down the line, straight in the pocket, great looking shot. Yeah, Martin's very pleased with that for an opener. Yeah, got off to a slow start in his singles match. His approach was absolutely perfect then, and the end product was perfect as well from Rash. Yeah, he's going to be looking for uh, a real captain's innings as well. Really needs the victory. Oh, he does in more, uh, more senses than just the uh, the scorecard as well, Cass, because if, if he loses this, he's the guy that put Martin Larson in. That's, that's going to be talked about a lot if, if this blows up in his face. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps his team members uh, won't let him live that down tonight when they're eating chicken and beer. Looking for number two. Uh, no, no joy, no luck there. 
for Martin Larson. Yeah, ringing ten pin. Good looking shot, maybe just a fraction of light. That's why the ten pin is standing up defiantly. Out comes the spare ball, hard and straight, not looking for any hook at all. That's how you deal with the single pin in the corner. Boy, how Sean Rash needs this. Yeah, chance for Rash. Looks as though he's enjoying himself, whether he's got uh, any muscle trouble or not. He's certainly enjoying himself here. Well, he does play the game with a smile on his face, doesn't he? And that smile will still be there after opening up with a double. Well, he's got something to prove as well. I mean, uh, Don Barrett picked him. If he, if he goes out and shoots 260 or 270, and, uh, Make Barrett's choice look a bit, uh, a bit silly, or unfortunate, should we say? Yes, the other potential choice could have been Kyle Troop, who has not bowled since the very first singles match, and he bowled a 2.24. But that's academic now. It's Rash that's in the chair, and right now it's L Larson back in the zone. Really good crowd here on Saturday night in Barnsley. Tickets available for Sunday's sessions as well. If you want to get yourself down to the Metrodome in Barnsley, if you're in the area, you want to watch some world-class bowling. And possibly another European win in the Weber Cup, although this man and his crew will have something to say about that. And it's far too early to be anointing any potential winner here. Well, that was a great-looking shot. I thought it had just thrown it a little bit wide to start with, but it came roaring back, hit the hip-in nicely. Sean Rash responding in style to the captain's pick. More to come after the break. Welcome back to the Weber Cup. It's the final match of the third session, the captain's pick. A significant game as each probes the other's weaknesses. Europe may well have got this one wrong. They opted for Sean Rash, and he's responding in style. He leads Martin Larson. Commentary comes from Cass Edwards and Nick Hawley. So Rash is perfect through three. Just the one ten pin left up by Larson. That's the difference. Oh my goodness me! Oh well, no, that's a game changer. Well, yeah, the seven ten off of a pocket hit is really unfortunate. Have a look here and see what went wrong. It's a little bit light in the pocket, so the four's gone round the seven, the six has gone round the ten, and they're both standing there quite defiantly. Well, he gave it a shot, but it's not the sort of spare that you pick up uh, without a lot of effort, and unfortunately, an open frame. Well, is he going to be able to recover from that? Because the way Rash is bowling at the moment. Well. It Unfortunately for Lucky Larson, it, he was unlucky. Well, now what was all that about? Yeah. Rash jumping all over the place. I thought for a second it hurt himself, but yeah, he did. He, he stuck on the approach. He's down well, on one knee. Yeah, not the first time that's happened to him either. It happened early in his last match that's right. no, against I mean, Dominic he, Barrett. He shot the strike and, and took 30 pins, but. Is he hurting somewhere? Has he hurt his sliding knee or something similar like that? Well, Rash might be hurting physically, but Larson will be suffering some mental pain right now after this that extremely unfortunate 7-10 that he did not deserve. So he's falling quite a way off the pace here, the Swede. Needs to get back in it. Just like that. It's 
absolutely needs to get back here with a strike. It's a nice looking shot, but I'm just wondering about that 7-10 split in the fourth. Now let's watch Rash very closely here, see if there are any physical effects. It doesn't appear to be. Oh, hang on, no, he's not happy, he's not happy. He knew instantly. Now, is that a result, do you think, of an adjustment that he made physically at the approach? I'm not sure. It may be that he's got a problem with that slide knee. That ball's just gone out and got hooked up in the hole. He's left the 1 2 4 and the 10 pin, which is a makeable spare. Very makeable. Um, but he didn't really want to throw it that wide. And he's, he's got four strikes in a row. Oh, he doesn't make it, though. Just the three Open count. Open frame. Yeah. That changes things once again. And he's looking desperately at the score sheet. I, he's not happy. He may be smiling, but I think there's something niggling either in his back muscle or he's done something to his sliding knee perhaps I'm only speculating but it's a big open frame after four strikes and what Larson's got to do well he's got to double up he really has to he has got to that's really rub Rash's face in it with a double that'll make it a very close match no, Gosh. never never gonna work yeah, it just hooked up high on the head pin, I'm afraid. It was a four pin standing. You need to be deeper in the pocket to, get, to carry that one. Just turns up too high, doesn't it? So that can only be a spare. Time for Rash to hit 10 after that uh, oh, the big open frame in frame number five. Strike here will open up a 22 pin lead. If he gets it. For the American captain. Yeah, looks a bit tentative at the approach there and was left a 10 pin. It may well be that uh, he really wants to get this game out of the way and perhaps get a bit of therapy tonight, but. Uh, just doesn't look happy, does he? No. Not a bad looking shot, rings the temping in the corner, so that can only be a spare, but... Ooh, hard and fast. And it keeps Larson within touching distance here. Yeah, just 11 pins in it with four frames to go. But Larson has got to start putting some strikes together, and that is not something he's managed in the entire match. Just three strikes, and they've been dotted right across the sheet. He's due one, strike spare, strike open, strike spare, so he's due another full 10 here. And as you see, Rash, who started off with four, has slowed. So Larson's got to make a move, and he's got to make it right now. That's gone wide, and it's left the seven pin as it cut in. It was left with too much work to do. Spares are not going to get the job done for Martin Larson. That was a massive change of delivery line. Gets right out to the outside boards, comes roaring back, light on the head pin. Nothing mixes around the seven, so it can only be a spare. Not his greatest shot. Now, whether that was a deliberate change of line or whether he just threw it too wide, we probably won't know. But hard and fast at the spare gives him 19 pins. But Martin is uh, bowling on sub 250 pace now. Yeah, I think he needs three strikes off the sheet here to. Uh, have a chance. Yeah. And give him a 246 game. And that chance will get a lot slimmer if this fella gets himself back in the zone. He's due. He's had an open. He's had a spare. And he's got another spare. So he's still keeping Larson alive here. <laughs> Martin is hanging on. Not that Sean Rash wants him to, but uh, really wanted a strike here. Good looking shot, corner penny yet again. And there is always the danger with these single pins. An error of judgment. We've seen a few. That is a glare into the crowd. <laughs> yes, he was telling somebody off there, wasn't he? Well, there's a little youngster bouncing up and down rather excitedly in his chair, and I think that he just caught, caught him out of the corner of his eye. He's still taking care of business. <laughs> Still the 11 pin lead. So 
So Sean went over and gave him a little uh, trinket, a little souvenir, and said, please sit down and sit still. <laughs> oh, that are his... Uh... He's nicked the kid's sweets, come on. Look at that pantomime villain. Three, then, serious three, business, this. Yeah, three frames to go. Larson really must hit two strikes. Really must. No, not happening. What is well, it with Swedes and these corner pins tonight? I mean, you would look at it and think that's that's perfectly in the pocket. It's a nice hook ball in behind the head pin. It must just take a deflection off that three. Pushes the six pin wide and straight around the ten pin. Four single pin spares so far for Martin Larson. Yeah, he'll be disappointed with this, and uh, Rash's decision has been fully vindicated here. Although he's still got a bit of work to do himself, because it's a long time since he had a strike. Yeah, but his advantage is that he hit four to start mm. with. So another two, and that, that will wrap it up for Team USA, I think. This has got to be the first one. This is a big ball. Well, potentially, even just staying clean could be enough. And he's done more than stay clean. He's taken all ten. I don't think there's any way back into this match for Martin Larson now. Well, the lead, the lead extends to 22 pins. After that little slap on the ten pin, and it's gone, and he's happy about that. He's got some words to say to the pins. He knows he's in the uh, advantage now. Larson must strike. And does. Needed that. Well, it gives him a shot in the tenth frame, if Rash will let him. Well, the six pin slaps the ten pin uh, from the side and he goes. There's not much more he can do. He's blasted this pocket for most of the game. Well, it means that Rash has just got to deal with this foundation frame himself. If he does spare or if he does have a disaster with a split, things could change and very quickly. But a strike will pretty much close the door. Get the Americans right back in this one. And that was so nearly the split. My goodness, how lucky was he there? It's going to be 10 pins difference between these two going into the last frame. So it'll be the first one to strike. He'll be the winner. Well, he's got to make absolutely sure of these two. Oh, just <laughs> about good enough. For a split second there, I wondered if he was going to miss the lead pin, but he didn't. And as you say, if Larson strikes, that puts an awful lot of pressure on Sean Rash. He will have to match it. So, it's out of his control, but he can at least make it very, very sweaty palm time for his opponent if he can get the strike here. The strike gives him 235. It will force the American to strike to win the point. What's he got? Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. We got the big finale we were looking for here. Pressure time now on Sean Rash because a great looking strike in the ninth and tenth frame from the Swede Martin Larson has set this up for a right to the wire finish. He knows exactly what that implies. And a here's strike the to win. It is as simple as that. Nothing else will do. It's got to be all ten for Sean Rash. And he's delivered. That was a huge ball from Sean Rash. Just look at what that meant to the American captain.
He had to get a strike, and with the very last ball of the session, he has come up when his team needed it. Instead of Europe enjoying a three-point advantage, Sean Rash, with the high-pressure ball of the match so far, has delivered, and that means the Americans are now trailing by one. What a Weber Cup we're enjoying here. It's Europe in front, 11 to 10. Sean Rash has put in a captain's performance and responded to the European challenge with a winning performance. Reaction and comment after the break. Sean Rash has stopped European momentum dead in its tracks with a match-winning performance selected by Europe as the weak link in the American team. He rose to the challenge and beat Martin Larson to put his side to within a point of their European rivals. The final day beckons in the fourth session of the tournament, a mixture of singles and doubles matches, and once again Dominic Barrett leads from the front as he takes on Kyle Troop each point growing in significance, this Europe's chance to restore their two-point cushion and America's opportunity to draw level. comes from Cass Edwards and Nick Halling. Nick, it's all to play for. It's a new game. And just to mention, they're on a <coughs> brand new condition lane. It's 43 feet of heavy oil, ratio of three to one. So there's three times as much heavy oil in the middle of the lane as there is on the outside. Both right-handers. Carl, obviously, the two-hander. And a pretty, what you would expect, start from the man from North Carolina. Scores 30 pins for the strike as we're on the world bowling scoring system. It's called the complete frame system. Strike is 30. And a spare is what you get on your first ball plus 10. An open frame bringing the obvious pins that you just dropped. Barrett leaves a solid 10 pin in the corner. That's what you tend to see more often than not. When a player doesn't take all 10, it's usually a pin that's just stuck in the corner that frustrates them. Both players playing quite tight down the right-hand uh, side of the lane. As I say, there's heavy oil, so they won't be looking to have too much hook on the outside of the lane to start with. All right, takes a nine spare worth 19. It was so important, going back to last night, Cass, so important really that uh, Sean Rash stepped up and won that last singles match against Martin Larson, which was a real nail biter. He won it by just 10 pins because the Europeans were just on a roll. They'd won seven out of nine, they'd gone in front, and another victory there would have made it 12 9 and put huge pressure on the Americans coming into this Sunday afternoon session, but Rash just steadied the ship, and Troop is certainly capable of levelling the overall competition at 11 apiece in this race to 19 points. Yeah, Troop looks very, very dialed in here. I told you, Cass, he bowled a 224 last time up in singles competition. You're not going to expect another one of those from this man. Well, I hear what you're saying, Nick, but he's had a 278 and a 277, or he's pretty much lined up on this lane. He, he, like Don Barrett, likes playing on the fresh oil, the long oil, before it starts to transition and, and the oil course moves around as the bowling balls go down. And the players have to look out for any sort of change in reaction of their bowling ball and make adjustments accordingly. Yeah, it certainly wouldn't be a surprise to see Troop bowling in the 260s, 270s, so Barrett already knows he's got to take those corner pins however you can get them that could be a very significant delayed messenger coming in and taking that 10 pin out 
Yeah, Dominic actually changed his line there on that shot. Came a little bit left with his feet on the approach and sort of played in and out. And gets a tap on the 10 pin from the uh, very slow messenger. But over it goes, 30 points. So let's see if Kyle Troop can keep his streak going here. Two perfect pocket hits, all pins carried. Three in a row is known as turkey in bowling terminology, and he has just taken his first turkey of this session and is looking very, very good indeed here. Absolutely dialed into that 1-3 pocket. The uh, two-hander really rips the rack there. Very amount of power and accuracy, obviously. Takes another 30. Look at this. Well, that's twice it stood up, and it was nearly the third time on the previous frame. Yeah, it's just a little bit of difference in the angle that the ball is coming in. That's just a fraction light, and that six has jumped right round the ten. Moves it standing there absolutely solid. So Dom's going to get out his spare ball, which will be a harder surface ball, and go straight at it and take the conversion. But that's uh, two spares out of three. That's not the start he wanted, especially with the way Troop is bowling. Nine spares are not going to get it done for Barrett and Team Europe. Yeah, 22-pin 20, uh, deficit already after three frames, as you can see on the, the graphic score sheet there. Now, the only good news there for Barrett is there is plenty of time to try and make this up as he just talks it over with one or two of his teammates, Martin Larson, down there. But in order to eat away at that 22-pin deficit, he's got to wait for Troop to give him something to bowl at. And at the moment, through f for three frames, Troop has been flawless taking his time and slowing things down here. Well, this is not his usual tempo and rhythm, but let's see if it affects his delivery. And no, it doesn't, although that was nearly the 7-10 split. Yeah, great-looking shot. A delayed reaction, as you said, Nick, on that 7-pin uh, and the 10-pin. It is a little bit light in the pocket. The 5-pin's gone, the 7-pin's gone, and the 10's gone at last. Yeah, very fortunate. And he knows it. Look at that. Get out of my way. I'm coming through. Oh, that forces Barrett to get in the strike zone like that. Long overdue, that one, for Barrett. Well, he did get one earlier, I suppose, but that was with a very delayed finish on the 10-pin. But this one is the first real good, solid pocket hit that's taken all 10 clean. And that'll settle Barrett down. Yeah, already Dom is looking at uh, quite a high hooking ball playing from uh, mid lane to out and then bringing it back. So it may well be that uh, the line that he's using is already drying up and he's having to make adjustments accordingly. Slightly fortuitous strike last time up for Troop. I'm sure he doesn't care. No, you take what you get in this business. And there was nothing fortuitous about that. That's a five-bagger for Kyle Troop. He is halfway to a perfect game. Two fingers, no thumb. Lots of strikes. Great-looking shot. He's actually gone quite wide here. Look at the reaction in the back end. That ball is just really ripping back to the pocket in the last uh, 18 feet of the lane. We've had a cluster of perfect games in the Weber Cup down the years. I'll come back to that in a moment. As Barrett has to strike now just to stick around. He cannot let this gap grow too much bigger, and that's oh, another well one that. <laughs> that owed a little bit to Lady Luck. My word, that was unusual. <laughs> we'll have a look at this again in slow motion. High on the head pin leaves the four, nine and the ten, and they all decide to fall over. Like some sort of coconut shy that is, isn't it? Look at that, amazing.
Welcome back to the Weber Cup, where Europe are in the unique position of defending an overall lead. But with the form of Kyle Troop of the USA, that now looks in doubt. He is perfect through the first half of the match with Dominic Barrett. A win here will level the overall scores. Your commentators are Cass Edwards and Nick Horning. Troop looking to add another 300 game to the small number. I think we've had six in the history of the Weber Cup. Five of them have come to Americans. Only Paul Moore of Europe, the Yorkshireman from down the road in uh, just outside Beverly in East Yorkshire, is the only European. Tommy Jones was the man that uh, has claimed most of them. But this fellow again is just slowing the tempo down a bit now. We've seen him as a very much a rhythm player, but he's just taken his time. He's checked a couple of times here. Hasn't affected his game in any way. But well, isn't it amazing, Cass? Sorry to interrupt you there. You've bowled five strikes and you still haven't got real daylight between yourself and your opponent. He's got he's got Don Barrett tucked in just behind him, so he needs another one here. Well, it's only 22 pins, and that can turn around in, in one frame. Like that. There is the turnaround. Now, it was significant that he checked a couple of times. He got away with avoiding a 7-10 split the last time he kind of almost psyched himself out of it. I didn't like it the way he just got out of his rhythm there. He really just twitched and fidgeted at the delivery area, and he's left himself the potential for an open frame, and there it is. And uh, Cass, you are working your crystal ball this afternoon because you said it can change around in one frame, and there is the change around. If Barrett gets a strike here, it's a one-pin game. Well, it was a 4-6 split, which is pretty impossible to pick up from a, a ball that went straight through the face of the number one pin. It's, uh, unfortunately, these two-handers get so much rotation on the ball. If it's in the pocket, it looks great. If it's out of the pocket, it can tend to leave some very awkward spares and splits, which has just occurred. So, chance for Don Barrett to get right back within a pin now. Yeah, he has to get a strike here. Yeah, that's going on. This is frame six, and this is getting very interesting. And Barrett has done the right thing, sticking around, not getting swept away by that fast start from Troop. That's his own turkey. Yeah, quite amazing. This is another great-looking shot from Don Barrett, who's been pretty much in the pocket every shot. But it's strange, isn't it? Carl's hit five strikes to start with, and he's only one pin in the lead. Young yeah, Jesper Svensson looking on in the crowd. Interesting to see how the uh, teammates react. Some just get out of it. Some stay up in the players area. Some sit in the crowd. Like Jesper. The troop. Oh, he's kicked that 10 out of there with the messenger. Yeah. Yeah. And out comes the, uh, the Afro hair picks. Trademark of the flamboyant Carl Troop, whose nickname is Fro. That messenger came from a long way back. <laughs> what a great looking shot that is, fantastic. Hair raising in fact. I'm going to pretend you didn't say that. Now he's just going to have to settle himself down again. This is far from one, but it does just throw the pressure back on Barrett, who is trailing, so he needs to keep striking. Well, the players are just bouncing pressure back onto one another, frame by frame. No, that wasn't a good shot. He's lucky to get nine there. Just drifted out of the pocket. Yeah, seemed a bit low on speed on that shot, and uh, it hooked up quite early. We are now getting quite a lot of reaction in the back end of the lane as the as the player's ball has come off the uh, corner of the oil pattern. And there you can see the ball's just... Oh, well, it's not turning left, but it's certainly snapping hard into the pin deck area. Leave us a four pin, which, if he spares, will be worth 19. Which he does. But a little gap has opened up here after seven frames. So time running out in this one. Barrett has been behind from the first frame. He's never been out of touch, but he's never been able to get past Troop either, who is, as we've seen, Kasser, a very good front runner. Well, he's, a, he's been a strike machine from carrying on from last year. He's got a 12-pin lead and a chance to uh, double up here, make two strikes in a row. And again, bounce more pressure back onto the uh, European captain. Well, that was.
was absolutely nothing wrong with that. That is back in the zone. Yeah, great looking shot, two strikes in a row. And of course, every time he hits a strike, it's worth 30 pins. And two more strikes, Troop wins. Simple as that. Whatever Barrett does. Yes, he'll um, close the shop, shut him out. Anything less than a strike here right now for Barrett. And this one will pretty much be done. And he's hooked it away again. Out of the pocket, out of luck, and out of this match, you would think. Uh, I would suggest that's pretty much over, yeah. Okay, it, it looked to me from where I am that the speed was down a little bit. Overreaction to back end, leaves the 3 6 10, which is a very ma makeable spare. Two spares in a row is not what he needs when uh, troops just doubled. Yeah, the spare is there, but it's not enough for Barrett. Yeah, 25 pins is the difference with just two frames to go. Well, he's won three in a row in singles, but that streak is coming to an end here. The only defeat had come right at the start of Weber Cup singles play against Kyle Troop, so he'll be sick of the sight of the man with the uh, the big hair. The only way he gets back into this is a major error from the American. And interestingly, both players are up next in the uh, doubles match. Tends to be the way it rolls, isn't it? When they go singles doubles, you keep the guy that's uh, had the hot hand, keep him on, and that settles this point. The Americans are back on terms here. Yeah, they're going to level it, level it up at uh, 11 each. Carl Troop has brought an absolutely great game here. A little bit light in the pocket, but he's got them. He's got the mix, and the seven pins gone. He's built eight strikes and just the one open frame. And the glory with the uh, World Bowling Scoring System, it, it actually increases the uh, score potential. And Don. that really is the end of the road for uh, Barrett, who also is up, as you say. He is in doubles action right next on this lane, along with Stu Williams, and Barrett's got to get his line back together again here. So whilst the point might be gone, there's a very important spare ball and another very important frame coming up for Barrett to sort his game out because it's gone right off the rails here. Well, that last shot was almost a practice, practice shot with another ball, which is what he's just done there. That's a, that was a, a strike ball shot for practice for the next game. He knows this game's lost. There's no point in trying to shoot two, two strikes. Get another ball, sort yourself out, and then come into the doubles game next. Troop, meanwhile, as I said, last time in singles play, bowled a 220 game, but 270 has been his benchmark. Other than that, there was no way you could expect he was going to bowl another low one, and indeed he is heading for another 270 game. Look at that, 279. Now that is a Weber Cup high this year. To go with a 277 and a 278 and a 267. Boy, this man is right back on form, and that comes as no shock. So Barrett, with the last ball of this particular match, went for a very wide line, so that was a little tester for him. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing. He's testing out his uh, different bowling ball for the doubles game, doubles game is coming in straight away. Spare for 221. Yeah, that's an absolute pounding win. Really strong statement there from Kyle Troop. This is an important session for the Americans. They've started it the way they will want this Weber Cup to carry on. That's two in a row going back to last night for the USA. And just as it looked like the wheels were coming off, they are back in business now, and thanks to Kyle Troop, they've leveled the match up. The series tied at 11 apiece in this race to 19.
welcome sight for the Americans who were outplayed in the last session. Not only has Kyle Troop won the opening match, he's also leveled the overall score. After 22 matches, these teams can't be separated. Kyle Troop is now talking to Hannah Wilkes. Well, Kyle, that was a very dominant performing and the start that you guys really wanted this afternoon, wasn't it? That was exactly the start we were looking for. We knew coming in we were down one. We definitely didn't want to get in an early deficit with the crowd. You know, it's Sunday at the Weber Cup. We know that Europe's going to be loud and cheering for them. So I came out firing and, you know, nine out of ten strikes is a pretty good start. That it is. And um, possibly more importantly for all of us watching at, watching at home and enjoying you, you as a showman, the picks are back. The Afrocombs are, are back out in force. Yeah, I got to bring out all the, you know, I'm going to be firing on all cylinders today. That means picks flying, pins flying. So uh, they're going to need to get used to that for the rest of the day. That hair's just going to get bigger and bigger the more you win. You know it. The Americans in high spirits, opening this final day of the Weber Cup with a win. It's important as it levels the scores as the winning line gets ever closer. A session of crucial singles matches still to play. And this, the 18th edition of the Weber Cup.